respect, protecting the, the artworks from damage coming from light. And then uh, uh, I'll move to more practical um, area, presenting you with a method which we can use to evaluate the light fastness, the fading of the object of art object, yes. And in this, in particular, I will focus on a micro fading test. And I have an instrument with me right on my desk right now, ready to, to do a measurement. So at the, towards the end of my presentation, I will switch the camera to present you the instrument and to present you the screen of the software controlling the instrument. And we'll try to do a little dem practical demonstration. Okay. So the, the light, light is uh, with the light in museum or gallery setting, we have this dilemma, this so-called catch-22 situation that we, we need the light in order to see things, but the light is an agent of distraction for many materials in collections. So as it was put uh, by Stefan Michalski from the Canadian Conservation Institute, uh, um, uh, we must balance the rights of our own generation with the rights of all future generations. Because if we use a strong illumination to see well, to present well objects in collections, then this light might create some damage and limit access to the original form of the artwork for people in the future. So uh, you've probably seen this many times, this list of 10 agents of deterioration it's not a complete list. I think we should one should include also natural processes and unintentional maltreatment. So all the mistakes that we people dealing with art sometimes do. Well, that's the reality. And on this list, of course, there's light. Light, which uh, we know on many examples, will alter the uh, appearance of objects, will bring some damage, not only to appearance, but also to a physical part of the object, just bringing some, some physical changes, not just discoloration. So when we think about light, we uh, uh, ask several questions. First, we would like to know how stable is the object and uh, to, uh, uh, to have some input into our policy planning, into exposure planning for the exhibit of this object and uh, we would like to know which objects in our possession, uh, in our collection, need some special treatment in this respect, a special protection. And we would like to know also what kind of color changes one can expect on a given object. So if we know that, for example, some work of art on paper, uh, uh, like, or a, a document, uh, an ink on a document uh, is uh, uh, not a last light fast one, so it's not stable. It's important to know in which direction the color changes will will move because if if there's a fading of the ink, the fading will uh, could could bring a change to the point uh, that we will stop seeing the ink. So we will lose the, the, the possibility to read the content of the object. And if it's a darkening of the ink happening when the object is exposed to light, it's a different story. Our judgment of the damage will be different because darkening of ink will change the aesthetic of the object, but will not limit our access to the content of the of object. This is a simple example with manuscript, but of course with, the, uh, with, with many uh, um, with many objects, well, uh, which creates our, our heritage, yes, the, the situation is much more tricky. But in general, we would like to know uh, uh, in which direction the color changes will happen if they will happen. Okay, so now I'll present a few, few basics uh, uh, about the interaction of light and materials, light and matter. And uh, from, from photochemistry, and photophysics, we knew some basic laws uh, which governs the photoreactions. And the, uh, uh, the first one, which is listed on the top right hand side of this slide, says that only absorbed radiation can cause chemical reactions. Yes, so um, if we have object with the reflectance, which is a, a, a blue one, uh, it means that it reflects the blue part of radiation 
and we know that the blue part of radiation carries the most of energy. I will I will uh, discuss this 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 subject in details soon. So uh, that's that's important statement uh, in this context of photodegradation. And the uh, another principle of photochemistry, which is very important in this uh, respect, discussing the photodegradation, is the so-called reciprocity principle or the bunsen rosco law, which says simply that the amount of product of photochemical reaction, so the product of photochemical reaction, is faded colorant, faded dye, faded pigment, yes, so the, the change in our object is determined by the total amount of energy, radiant energy absorbed by the photochemical system, meaning the higher the dose of radiation, the higher the dose of light, the bigger the change. Yeah? So that's why it's called recipe principle. And the, this radiant energy, let us look in more details into this. What's, what's that? So, First, we have the intensity of light hitting the object, reaching the surface of the object. But then we have to take into account the time for which this light is interacting with the object. So it will create something we call a dose. But it's not all, because we have to, dealing with the photodegradation of heritage objects, we have to look closely at the spectral power distribution of light. What's the intensity of different parts of radiation uh, in, a, in a sense of different wavelengths of radiation in the light which is uh, uh, interacting with the object. So spectral power characteristic is important and that we know very well also from practice. That's why we remove this, uh, the most damaging parts of radiation, namely ultraviolet from the light sources and from, from any sources. Uh, uh, of illumination on for objects in uh, on the exhibit, yes, and also an important element is reflectance. So the spectral characteristics of the object, because as the first law stated on the slide says, only absorbed radiation could cause any damage. Yes, so if we have object which is white or nearly white, it will reflect most of the radiation. So the danger of photodegradation is smaller than for darker objects, which absorb higher percentage of radiation. Okay, now let's look at uh, uh, this equation, uh, which uh, uh, tells us about the energy of radiation for one mole of photons. Yes, so when we uh, as you can see in this equation, there's a lambda, there's a wavelength of light. So the energy depends on the wavelength of light. And uh, probably most of you know already, yes, this fact that the, there is a, a strong dependence of the energy and the wavelength of light. And the higher energy, uh, the, the, the shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy. As, as you can see, when we move from the deep red, from the verge of human seeing, yes, 750 nanometers to uh, the other part, the other edge of the visible spectra for humans uh, uh, to 400 nanometers, we nearly double the amount of energy carried, carried by light. So is it so that the light, uh, uh, blue light, all this uh, 400 nanometer uh, has a, uh, uh, is will bring double the change as compared with this deep red, not so easy. Because when we look at the, at the, at the compounds which constitute our materials, uh, when we irradiate, with, when, when we use the light with the longer wavelength, carrying not so much energy, it will not create any change or chemically. There will be no bonds broken yes so there's no splitting of bonds as you can see here for different bonds between carbon and hydrogen oxygen carbon carbon uh, in different types of organic compounds the energy needed to break this bond for photolysis yes uh, is usually quite high as you can see here 80 90 100 110 kilocalories per mole of photons so we are in the ultraviolet Domain, in the part of spectra which is not visible by humans and which is excluded from illumination in museums. So it, it seems that we are on a safe side because the 
photolysis, meaning breaking the chemical bonds due to the absorption of light, will not happen even for sensitive organic materials because the energy needed for these processes to happen uh, lays in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum. But well, that type of conclus conclusion could be built uh, when we perform uh, exp photochemical experiments on a simple systems, when we have dilute solution uh, uh, of a single compound and we illuminate this with a well-defined radiation on the laboratory bench. But the reality is much more complicated. And we know, and it was uh, uh, presented in the conservation literature, you have the reference here, uh, by um, International Commission of Illumination Technical Report from 1990, that, that the damage potential of radiation uh, uh, looks more like this red curve here. Yeah? So uh, with the uh, near infrared or deep red light, there is very little damage usually because this is, was calculated, was proposed, averaging over a large number of materials, so different types of materials, yes, so uh, it's just an average, uh, just to give you our, an idea of a damage potential for the light in interaction with uh, heritage materials. And when we move to shorter wavelengths, you see that there's a, a, a very steep increase in the damage potential of the light, yes, so because uh, it's not the photolysis, which is a dominant process in photodegradation. There are other processes that I will present in a second. And that, that's why we have this significant increase in the damage potential for the light of shorter wavelengths, still visible light, so 500, 450, 400 nanometers, uh, as compared with the red light. Yes. Okay, so because photolysis is a very rare process in reality, what type of processes are responsible for the degradation that we are seeing for heritage objects? So light constitutes, is a form of energy. So when it's absorbed by the materials, molecules in these materials will transfer into so-called excited state. So this excess of energy will be stored for a, a usually very brief, brief duration of time, and something then will happen with this energy. Some of these processes are of physical nature, so there will be very often just dissipation, just removal of this excess of energy in the form of heat. So the light absorbed by the object will, will warm its surface, yes, will heat it up. And there's also a possibility that some radiation processes will occur. And we know fluorescence and phosphorescence are well studied processes which, which happens when the light is absorbed by materials also in a heritage context. But there are also some chemical changes possible. So there's a possibility of a change of the structure of the molecule, photolysis, which is a very rare process. So we can practically ex exclude this, there is no UV, UV presence, but the most important mechanism is this, uh, uh, is, is named here at the last line of the slide. This excess of energy will be transferred to another molecule of atom and it will start a chain of reactions. Let's look closely at this concept. So we have a light, could it be natural or artificial? which is absorbed, part of it is absorbed by our object. And the, the, the part which is reflected will create the sensation of color of the object. So it's responsible, this absorption is responsible for color. And this part of light which is absorbed uh, will be dissipated in the form of heat or in a form of radiation, but part of it will initiate some further reactions by by forming excited states of molecules. And because all of objects and we are submerged in the air, 
So there is oxygen always present on the surface of objects in collections. And the oxygen is very reactive species, very reactive molecule. And there's also humidity present in the air, so water molecules. And these simple molecules, water and oxygen, uh, very often interact with these excited states of molecules, which are created due to absorption of light by matter, and then uh, processes which are responsible for degradation will occur. So chemical degradation will bring change of color. So we have this, uh, this well, very general mechanism of photodegradation uh, right now explained and, and shown on the screen. So uh, just since I'm a chemist, just a few reactions, schemes. Uh, 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 so we have this radiation being absorbed by, uh, let's say, organic dye, yes, which is then transferred in the excited state, yes. And this process, which is not typical for chemical reactions, does not depend on temperature. Photochemistry doesn't depend uh, uh, so easily, let's say, like just the, 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 the standard chemical reactions on temperature. And then this excess of energy is transferred to smaller molecules like oxygen, and we have an excited state of oxygen, or to water, and we have uh, hydrogen peroxide, which is, as we know well, very a potent oxidizing agent. Yes. So when we have our substrate or our dye, so on on the paper or parchment or some uh, whatever substrate was used, this uh, uh, this um, this reactive uh, species uh, uh, like excited oxygen or, or water in the form of water peroxide will react, bringing damage, bringing oxidation to the elements of the system, which are uh, creating the appearance of the drawing, painting, or document, and also damaging the substrate. And uh, here there's some dependency on temperature, because at higher temperatures, the, the materials will lose some of the water content, so there will be less water available for the system. Yes? So at higher temperatures, photodegradation might be not as quick as lower temperatures, which seems to be a kind of a paradox because we expect that every reaction depends on the temperature in such a way that the higher temperature, the faster the reaction. So uh, maybe I will leave this. Uh, uh, I already said this, this content of this slide. Okay, so the oxygen and water are very important uh, elements in the system when we discuss photodegradation. So let us well consider removing oxygen and removing moisture. And we can do it using so-called anoxic enclosures. And uh, here I'll present you some results of the test that we did in our laboratory in Krakow uh, in, uh, in a glove box in which we removed oxygen and we removed any moisture from the gas atmosphere inside this enclosure and we perform light fading experiments. So in this anoxic or zero oxygen conditions, you can see that uh, uh, here the gray bars stands for zero oxygen and the blue one for the standard room temperature. There are some objects, some colorants, which will not benefit very much from the removal of oxygen. So degradation doesn't go uh, in this case, necessarily to oxidation with the oxygen being an intermediate product yes, so, or substrate for the reactions. But, but for some colorants, we can really slow down photodegradation by removing oxygen, like for metal violet, yes, or here is a, is a paper used from, from uh, produced by the Fabriano, uh, uh, which is used by artists to, to draw or paint. And uh, this colored paper will benefit. We have a more than double uh, 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 higher uh, uh, degradation in the, at the room temperature in anoxic conditions, degradation is much uh, slower. Yes, so the removal of oxygen and the removal of water could bring some positive change as when uh, in, in photo degradation. So there's an option to which can be discussed and there's a quite number of literature presenting this. And here you can see on this photo, a little setup that we used later on instead of this glove box, just small enclosure for a model samples of colored papers 
and we use CO2 cylinders to flush the inside of this little enclosure with the gas, uh, uh, just to removing the, 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 the normal atmosphere with 21% of oxygen from inside. Yes? So with this little setup, we were able to test light fastness in standard room atmosphere and in anoxic conditions. So you don't need any high-tech equipment to do experiments like this. Okay, so to summarize this introduction, this, this mechanisms of photodegradation, uh, photooxidation is uh, happens mostly for organic materials, which are much more sensitive than inorganic. So the pigments are usually much more stable than dyes or other forms or types of uh, organic matter. And the fading of composite materials, and we usually have, a, a, we're dealing with that type of complex materials, uh, um, it's much more complex, hard to judge based on the simple rules, on the simple experiments, simple mock-up samples. And uh, we can say that uh, uh, um, the stability of such composite materials is as good as the stability of the most light sensitive components. And uh, another uh, conclusion uh, uh, when we speak about the mechanism of photodegradation, that the light, which is always not just the single factor of degradation, there is always uh, some, some other uh, 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 factors present like pollutants, uh, uh, um, some chemical imperfections, so, uh, 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 and, and there are some synergistic effects. So the photodegradation could speed up if we have uh, uh, um, unfavorable conditions at which the object is presented or even stored. Oops, that's the wrong slide. Whoa, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. I mixed the presentations, so um, I'm sorry for this technical. Uh, I will stop this presentation. Open the the one which is uh, in a final form. Yes. So once again, and uh, let me check. Not this one. Oops. I'm sorry for this. Uh, I have to close this and open again the right presentation. Oh, yes, that's the one. So I need to share the screen again. So I hope that now I'm at the right place. Yes. Okay. Sorry for this. So um, now I, I move to a second part with some recommendations for the proper exposure of objects on the museum wall. And you've seen already this uh, that uh, uh, equation sort of that the uh, radiant energy is the uh, interplay of, of many of many parameters and if we want to limit the gradation of the object we will uh, uh, reduce the irradiance so we will use a lower uh, uh, intensity of light and we are probably familiar with this rule that 50 lux seems to be a good compromise between the light which is needed just to see the things on the museum wall and uh, photo degradation so we will a lower intensity of illumination. We, we should also, for sensitive objects, limit illumination time because intensity and time gives us a dose. And uh, as we know from reciprocity principle, the dose is the most important for photodegradation. Yes? So we will limit illumination time just uh, moving the object, which are regarded as sensitive, into dark storage or using some other ways protecting the object from the irradiance, so shortening the illumination time. We can also play or modify spectral power distribution, so character of light which is used by removing UV, and this is a basic thing that uh, uh, I, I think nowadays in every museum is applied, so UV filters on windows and the artificial light with no, with zero UV 
present in the spectral power distribution. So we can choose the light sources, artificial light, yes, uh, looking at spectral power distribution, which will be the best for the object that we want to illuminate. And also there's a, with nowadays light sources, there's uh, an option to, to think to, uh, about light sources using a spotlight uh, to illuminate a given object with the light, which is uh, designed for this particular object, designed in a sense that the spectral power distribution is such, is modified to such a uh, curve or character of light uh, that the, it will bring the lowest damage, uh, still allowing the viewers to see the whole colors on the object. So let's say we have a blue object, yes, which is predominantly blue. And when we illuminate it with the white light, um, which contains a part of the red, yes, so there's a red radiation, which will be absorbed by the blue object. And, but it's not important to create the aesthetic of the object. We don't need this red light. So we can use a so-called cold, a light source without this uh, uh, red part of the spectra and still see all the colors and reduce the amount of energy absorbed by the object. And this exposure, well, recommendations uh, uh, um, in the in the conservation literature, you will you will, you will find many uh, mm, 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 many concepts. Yes, many uh, uh, illumination rules for different classes of objects and the, probably the best known book on the topic is by Gary Thomas, The Museum Environment, in which this author shows the, some, some limits for different classes of objects, limits of, of uh, uh, intensity of light expressed in photometric limits in laxes, and the, you, you see this value 50, 50 laxes, which is recommended uh, in, in, in the conservation literature for works on paper and the uh, uh, photo, photos and, and, and other materials which contain organic dyes. But these groups, these uh, categories of objects are very broad, yes. So works on paper with colored media, it's a very broad category. Do we really need to uh, present only at 50 laxes, which is quite limiting, especially for older people and especially for objects with low contrast. It doesn't give you the real comfort of seeing the colors, yes. So that's something, well, that I will discuss on in the last part of my presentation. So uh, using this, these rules and using so-called blue wool standards as a reference material, blue wools are set of, of textiles which were dyed with different uh, uh, um, organic dyes of a different light fastness. And it was developed in the 50s for the textile industry and adopted by the community of heritage scientists to express light fastness of objects as equivalents of blue wool. So also there's a ISO ESO standard which uses this concept of uh, light fastness of this reference material, blue wool standards. Yes, so we have this eight categories or nine categories, in fact, uh, uh, which are equivalent to blue wool one, two, three. So blue wool one uh, is the most sensitive, blue wool eight is the le least sensitive uh, uh, type of material. So we know what kind of a dose of light is needed to see just not noticeable fading for a given material belonging to these categories, number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight. Yes, so uh, uh, very often uh, a much broader categories are used uh, uh, for heritage objects. Uh, we describe them as sensitive, intermediate, or durable, as you can see, just connecting this uh, light fastness of categories one, two, three, four, five, six, and so on. And so uh, using these broad categories, yes, there are some recommendations, what kind of illumination can be used and what kind of uh, fading can be expected from the object belonging to a given category of the periods of time which are expressed here. And the maximum recommended dose, uh, for example, for category A is uh, with the illumination of 50 lux uh, um, four weeks a year. So a dark storage is recommended for all the objects belonging to category 
A. And this is uh, something which, as I said, these categories are very broad and uh, it will really limit the possibility to present the objects from collections to viewers. And different museums use different approaches uh, to fulfill these requirements, these re recommendations. And here I'll show you a few photos from the places which uh, applied uh, interesting ways of limiting the exposure of objects in the collection. Here is a, uh, um, there's a, um, this photo was taken in The Hague. Uh, there's a, a national archive and the, 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 the light in the, 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 the showroom is very dim, very, there's a very low intensity of light. So this spot illumination of objects create the feeling as if there was a lot of light on the object, whereas because the whole room is dark, yes, it's not the case. Yes, our eyes are adjusting, adopting to this low light conditions. And the objects are presented also on the screen, on the touch screen, so you can scroll through pages even for some books and, and read the history of the objects. So uh, you can look at the photos of a, of a given areas of, on the page, yes, increase it, but on a screen, yes, so no much light is needed on actual object. And second example that I would like to present to you is National Library, a new institution in Qatar, a National Library in Qatar, there's a lot of light in this part of the world, and there, there's a large area with windows in this library, and you can see the open stacks type of arrangement in this library, and they also have a quite a collection of uh, uh, valuable historical objects. And it's also sort of open access situation here. As you can see, there's no ceiling, there's no roof on these rooms where this uh, um, historical collection is presented. But uh, I'll present you another photo of the same location, yes. So the light in the upper part uh, of the library, there's a lot of light, yes. But in this lower part, there's nearly no artificial light, so it's very dark. So the, the total amount, the dose of light that is reaching this object is very low. So very clever way of showing the objects, uh, uh, but also limiting the amount of light absorbed. Okay. So now I move to more practical applications of, of, of science into this topic of uh, photodegradation. So we now, I already presented you this principle of reciprocity, which tells us simply that the dose is this thing which governs the extent of degradation. So amount of change in the, in the object is proportional to the amount of a dose or light absorbed. So let's say we illuminate our object for 10 hours with 100 lux, yes? And this, according to this rule, will be equivalent to 20 hours, double the time with, uh, with but the lower illumination, 50 lux, yes? But we can move to, let's say, with the, when we increase the time of exposure to 1,000 days, yes? So we have one mega lux hour of illumination, yes, 10 hours a day, uh, nearly three years, yes, 1,000 days and 100 lux, it's, the dose would be one mega lux. And we can deliver this one mega lux of exposure, this dose of light, when we have a very high intensity of a light source within 10 minutes. So we can mimic the photochemical changes on the object in a short duration of a short laboratory experiment, not waiting these three years. So that's open the space for so-called accelerated aging in the context of heritage materials. So museum illumination, low intensity, long time, and accelerated a photo aging, high intensity in a very brief duration of time. And this accelerated aging is a known procedure. Most of the products around us were tested with this or that method of accelerated aging. Uh, such tests can be performed in uh, natural settings with natural light, but more often uh, um, artificial aging chambers, some type of chain chambers are used. This type of chamber, sun test, uh, it requires uh, to, to mimic, to, to, be, to give the radiation the dose, which is equivalent of one month, month of exposure to the daylight in, uh, in Central Europe, it, it requires a test with a duration of 70 
nine hours of illumination, so quite long. Yes? Still, the, the amount of light is not enough to really speed up the processes so much yes, as we would like. And so there are commercial products to perform such aging experiments, but people often resort to some arrangement they build in the laboratories, as you can see here uh, or here. This photo, I took it at the Library of Congress, at the laboratories there, and they used some kitchen appliances and a UV lamp uh, to, uh, illuminate the, to illuminate objects. So there are, there are technical ways to uh, uh, accelerate photo aging, and there are also standards for this. So there are standards uh, prepared for different classes of materials. Some of them are very close to our interests, like this. Standards for uh, artist materials, coatings and textiles or adhesives. So we can follow such procedures uh, uh, but uh, and, and test light fastness of objects. But the problem is that uh, we, we can do it for materials used in, in uh, conservation, or to test Thomas, conservation you have just five, you have just five minutes left. Eh? Okay, uh, but you you cannot do this for originals because it's a destructive. Yes, so that's something uh, uh, um, that you well limits our possibility to to do the testing. Yes. So, but in 1999, there was a paper pub published presenting the technique which can be used to test light fastness on a micro scale. So when we have a light source of a high irradiance, yes, high power light source, we focus this light on a tiny point. This light reflected, uh, this light will bring a change to the object, will cause accelerated aging, and will be reflected and uh, gathered to a spectrophotometer, and which will then uh, measure the reflectance and transform this into colorimetric values. Yes, so the equipment could look like this. You can see the the lamp, the xenon lamp fiber optics and the spot of light, which to the camera, it seems big, but it's in reality, it's quite small. Yes. So that's the setting. This one at the laboratories at the National Museum in Krakow, which is using this technique. And this technique was popularized probably the most by Bruce Ford from Australia, who built such setups for many museums, many research laboratories around the world. And he's running a web page, microfading.com, at which you can find more information about microfading. And also a list of different institutions which are using this manual setups for microfading. A few years back, I partnered up with a company in Krakow, which builds uh, uh, prototypes of scientific equipment. And we built an automated together, an automated device for microfading. And here you see the list of institutions which are already using this equipment built in Krakow. So this is something I, 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 I think I can call a success story that we managed to introduce an instrument for heritage science, which was accepted by quite a number of important uh, heritage institutions and research facilities. So uh, in this instrument, we use a LED light source and the, there is also an option to have uh, six different sources in the instrument. So you can choose the spectral power characteristics, so different color temperatures, uh, depending on your liking, what, what you would like to use for the testing. Yes. So the light is uh, focused on a very tiny spot on the object, in this case about 0.5 millimeter. And because the spot is so small for humans, it's difficult to see color changes on such a small scale. Uh, because a light uh, is from the LED is used, there is no heat generation. As you can see here, with something like seven megalux light output of the lamp, so very high intensity of light, we have increase of temperature by about nine degrees. So it's not significant. And the spectrometer, which kind of looks at the this spot, measures the spectra, measures the reflectance. And the duration of the test is about six to 15 minutes. And the spectra, this reflectance, is recalculated in the colorimetric values. Here on the screen, you see the curves measured for different samples. And these are aging curves with a duration of five minute test, which show how big was the color change for the object. So, well, we, 
testing different objects, we will see different types of curves, sometimes with a plateau, sometimes nearly linear, uh, because, well, our materials are usually very complex systems, so one cannot expect the same type of curve. Um, and depending on, on the type of curve, it's important question at which point we will finish our measurement, because if we finish prematurely, like here, we'll judge that this sample is the most sensitive because there's the highest color change, whereas in reality, it's quite stable on the long run. So uh, using microfading, we can also test uh, blue wool as a reference material. And I've already told you a little bit about these blue wools. Uh, um, so mater reference material with different light fastness. And here, these curves were measured with microfader for blue wools number one, two, three, and four. And you can see the differences in the color change for this uh, reference materials in the course of the test, taking just five minutes, yes? So when you do measurements for your collection, you can easily rank your objects, comparing them with blue wools. Here, I included these red bars. They represent color change in a given duration of the test for blue wool one, blue wool two, and three. So from this collection tested, so each bar represents an object tested on the microfading, you see that the part of the collection is even more sensitive than blue wool one. And of course, we, through this measurement, we knew an exact numbers of color change. We knew the, the changes of lightness, yes. So our predictions of color changes could be quite precise. And since the measurement is practically non-destructive, we will not see the, the faded spot on the object. It's possible to fade, well, precious artworks, like here, this painting by Munch. The instrument could be mounted on a tripod, so we can measure on the museum wall, because some objects are too big for, too big for a laboratory bench. And here, just a few shots from the measurement a campaign that we did in Oslo for Munch Museum, uh, that we selected points on uh, painted layers, also we tested supports, and when we spotted a weak color, bringing a big color change, we, we, uh, uh, we, we, we did a second or even third test to make sure that it's not some artifact, but it's a real color change. And the test took just six minutes per point, which is equivalent of a dose of 0.5 megalux hour. So uh, we tested different colors, different uh, uh, different points. There is no time for me to go into details, but just to give you a brief idea how this test could look like. It's also, we tested different papers because if we uh, see a different fading characteristic for paper, we can judge that the paper has a different composition, which is also an important piece of information. So to sum up, the microfading is a non-contact. Well, there's just a radiation which is uh, uh, um, interacting with the object. There are practically no visible marks on the objects. And within a few minutes, we can have some data which will allow us to compare the light fastness with the reference material and to, uh, um, and to see what kind of color changes could the future bring for the object. Um, so there's uh, some literature online for those of you who might be interested in the technique. So microfading.com, a web page by Bruce Ford, also Getty Conservation now published a report about the technique. And also, of course, there are plenty of papers in which researchers presented this uh, 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 data from microfading. And that's all what I prepared that maybe the time was too short for me to, to do this practical part, but well, uh, and maybe on some other occasions, I will have the, the, the chance to show you the instrument in operation, yes, in working. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'm ready uh, to, to answer. Great. Great. Thank you, Thomas, for your presentation. Uh, you have been very, very, very very short time, time, so it is okay. uh, uh, we can follow you. Follow. We could follow you follow. very well. Um, yes, uh, generally now uh, the floor is open for question uh, that can be written both in the chat or you can raise your hand, and I we will allow you to to ask your question directly. 
with the with the video. So we are waiting for uh, some comments or yes, Julia Vanucci uh, raised her hand. 